Hello, I'm Professor Sue Rigby and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Bath Spa University. I'm lucky to lead a diverse community of about a thousand staff and almost 11,000 students now, spread out between Bath and London and all over the Midlands of England. What I value about them is that diversity. No one is the same as another, no one group should be privileged over another. And inclusivity to me is about hearing all of those voices and celebrating all of the people who have those voices and knowing that they're listened to. Equality Week's really important because it's a way we can focus ourselves on listening to all the voices we need to hear. It wouldn't be enough if that was the only week in the year when we cared, but it's a really good showcase for all the ways in which we do care 52 weeks of the year. So 20th to the 24th of March, I'll be there and I'll really look forward to seeing you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Join us for Equality Week from the 20th to the 24th of March 2023, where we have four guest speakers speaking all about sexuality, race, gender, allyship, disability, where we can hear their actual lived experience, which is so important for us to grow and learn. We'll also have various workshops where you can help us shape equality, diversity and inclusion at Buff Spa University. All of these events will be at Locksbrook, Newton Park and online and is welcome for anybody to come and join us from staff, students to the general public too. So join us from the 20th to the 24th of March for Equality Week. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, I'm Neetu, I'm the Vice President of Welfare and Community at Bath Spa Student Union. For me, inclusion at Bath Spa means that we all share like a happy medium 
for um, showcasing our different experiences and to learn from each other at our time here. Equality Week is important so we can sit and educate each other about things that we didn't know before or come together from all across the UK and around the world to find out more about each other, find out about ourselves and hopefully go away from university with more knowledge. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, um, I'm Bhavana. I'm currently pursuing a master's in illustration at Bath Spa University. I also work as the communications assistant at the Students Union in this university. For me, there are three levels to inclusion. The first one is toleration, the second is acknowledgement, and the third is celebration. At Bath Spa University, I've always felt celebrated for my difference. I think Equality Week is important because there is such beauty in multiplicity, in multiplicity of voices, in multiplicity of uh, responses to the world and methods of engagement with it. And to provide space for all of these voices to coexist and to amplify the ones that are feeble is an incredible act of compassion. And paradoxically, when we're aware of the diversity that exists, around us, we're also made aware of the universality of human experience. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us?
I'm Dr. Shuman Ghosh. I'm subject leader film and television. I'm based in the School of Art, Film and Media. I am also co-chair of the Global Inclusivity Network. I've worked in BSU for 12 years. It's the longest I've worked anywhere and over the years I've seen it sort of grow and evolve. And one of the things that has always been part of the appeal for BSU to me has been the kind of inclusive intent uh, that I see around us. And a lot of that is about having the space for people to grow, having the space for people to sort of find their place. So it is about equality of opportunity. It is about finding a platform for many voices. That's something that I've seen at BSU. And that to me is what inclusivity is primarily about uh, in this institution. The fact that we are all able to have a voice is something which I think counts for, for a great deal. Equality Week is important because it sort of highlights what equality means. It can form that space which thereafter results in issues that we identify and actions that we take around the year. Equality being uh, something which underpins a lot of other questions. Equality of opportunity, equality of purpose, uh, equality as an idea which allows people to sort of participate knowing that they have an equal right uh, within the institution to make themselves heard. Equality Week, therefore, to me, is that opportunity which allows these questions to be raised, which we can follow up through the course of the year. It's not a thing in itself, but it is, it is something which is a means to an end. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us?
Hello, I'm Professor Sue Rigby and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Bath Spa University. I'm lucky to lead a diverse community of about a thousand staff and almost 11,000 students now, spread out between Bath and London and all over the Midlands of England. What I value about them is that diversity. No one is the same as another, no one group should be privileged over another. And inclusivity to me is about hearing all of those voices and celebrating all of the people who have those voices and knowing that they're listened to. Equality Week's really important because it's a way we can focus ourselves on listening to all the voices we need to hear. It wouldn't be enough if that was the only week in the year when we cared, but it's a really good showcase for all the ways in which we do care 52 weeks of the year. So 20th to the 24th of March, I'll be there and I'll really look forward to seeing you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Join us for Equality Week from the 20th to the 24th of March 2023, where we have four guest speakers speaking all about sexuality, race, gender, allyship, disability, where we can hear their actual lived experience, which is so important for us to grow and learn. We'll also have various workshops where you can help us shape equality, diversity and inclusion at Buff Spa University. All of these events will be at Locksbrook, Newton Park and online and is welcome for anybody to come and join us from staff, students to the general public too. So join us from the 20th to the 24th of March for Equality Week. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, um, I'm Bhavana. I'm currently pursuing a master's in illustration at Bath Spa University. I also work as the communications assistant at the Students' Union in this university. For me, there are three levels to inclusion. The first one is toleration, the second is acknowledgement, and the third is celebration. At Bath Spa University, I've always felt celebrated for my difference. I think Equality Week is important because there is such beauty in multiplicity, in multiplicity of voices, in multiplicity of uh, responses to the world and methods of engagement with it. And to provide space for all of these voices to coexist and to amplify the ones that are feeble is an incredible act of compassion. And paradoxically, when we're aware of the diversity that exists, around us, we're also made aware of the universality of human experience. Can you hear us? 
Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, I'm Neetu. I'm the Vice President of Welfare and Community at Bath Spa Student Union. For me, inclusion at Bath Spa means that we all share like a happy medium for um, showcasing our different experiences and to learn from each other at our time here. Equality Week is important so we can sit and educate each other about things that we didn't know before or come together from all across the UK and around the world to find out more about each other, find out about ourselves and hopefully go away from university with more knowledge. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to Bath Spa for those of you who are external and haven't been here before. This week is Equality Week um, and Nick is our, our first person this week so I'm really excited. And at the end I'll put these slides up again if you want to come to any other events we'd love to see you there. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for coming and I'll pass over to Nick now. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Wow. I will say, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm running on drag queen time. So, <laughs> so uh, just get into it, I guess. Bring up the Bible in queer spaces often feels ominous. As a text frequently used to justify hate speech and discrimination, many of us have been trained to fear it. When Christians talk about the Bible, queer people often expect an attack. 
we expect words like sin, abomination, or unnatural. Even with the increased visibility of LGBTQ plus affirming interpretations of Christianity over the past decade, many still believe, or indeed force the belief on others, that the Bible is an inherently homophobic and transphobic text, that there is no place for queerness or queer people in the church, and it is a religious obligation for Christians to oppose equal human rights. I would describe this belief with one word, bullshit. <laughs> I use that word very intentionally and with the greatest consideration um, in reference to the American philosopher Harry G. Frankfurt uh, from his famous uh, 1986 essay uh, on bullshit. There is a difference between bullshit and a lie. When someone tells a lie, they know the truth, yet they deliberately choose to subvert it. However, in the case of bullshit, the person in question does not care what the truth is. Instead, they are merely concerned uh, with a point for their own specific purpose. This is exactly the case with biblically grounded homophobia and transphobia. It's not an argument that should be treated in good faith, but a deception that's been so frequently told to fit certain pole polemical goals that people have come to believe it to be true even without studying the Bible itself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or what I do, um, my name is Nick, uh, and I have been doing LGBT activism, specifically in relation often to Christianity, specifically Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is the predominant form of Christianity they have in countries like Russia, Serbia, Greece, Eastern Europe, um, for about 10 years. Um, I've been involved in all kinds of different campaigns, traveling around in that part of the world, taking place in uh, part in pride marches and all kinds of various bits and bobs. I also have, um, this is the little bragging section, <laughs> I also have published academic work on the history of sexuality and Christianity and orthodoxy in English and in Russian. Uh, and I've uh, lectured around the world um, on the subject as well. Um, in my talk for you today, I'd like to show you how the Bible doesn't have a univocal anti-LGBT message inherent within the text, and that the, those who argue that it does do so to fit certain right-wing identity politics goals. I'd also like to show you that this sort of um, um, biblical interpretation often claims to be like literal, like a literal interpretation, but like I think when you actually get into the meat of it, it really is actually quite far opposite. Um, I'm going to be mainly talking about the issue of sexuality, um, um, as that's kind of been the focus of my study over the past like uh, 10 years or so. So um, we won't be sp uh, speaking specifically to issues of like transgender identity. However, a lot of what I'm going to talk about can be applied, and if we get some time for questions at the end, I'm very happy to just like talk some more on that specific issue because there is like kind of uh, overlap. I'd also like to point out at this point that um, um, some uh, trigger warnings. Um, so we are obviously going to be discussing homophobia and transphobia, but there is going to be discussion of um, sexual assault and some um, frank discussions about certain sexual acts. So if that sounds like something that uh, may be difficult for you to listen to this evening, then feel free to leave at any point. Uh, there's no judgment uh, whatsoever. Um, I also hope that by the time we sort of finish talking today, it's not going to be... It's a big topic. It's not going to be absolutely exhaustive, but I want to kind of go through some of the sort of like most used uh, verses against queer people in the Bible and sort of explore them, explore why the homophobic interpretations of them that you might be familiar with are not um, as true as they have been uh, portrayed, I would say. Um, and I think that even if you're not someone who's massively interested in the subject of um, religion and um, Christianity and LGBT rights, I think that this subject actually really delves into the heart of how we as a society look at sexuality and how the history of sexuality has kind of, uh, sort of developed in our, in our culture. So um, I think you'll take something away from it, for sure. So, homosexuality, <laughs> a brief history. Before we even open a Bible to investigate these so-called homophobic verses, the best place to start is by looking at our own understanding of sexuality. As any English literature student will tell you, there's no such thing as an unbiased reading of a text. And we always bring something of ourselves to that text, and that is definitely true with the Bible. For the past 150 years, Christians discussing the issue of queerness in the Bible have done so in reference to homosexuality. 
In fact, when I was at university, the debate around whether LGBTQ plus people should be included in the church was often referred to as the problem of homosexuality or the question of homosexuality. And the use of that specific word homosexuality is significant. It's a word that sounds scientific, it's a word that sounds ancient, and it is actually neither. <laughs> The word was first invented in 1869 by a psychiatrist called Richard von Kraft Ebbing in his most notable work known as Psychopathia Sexualis. At the time he wrote the book, psychiatry was a very new science. It was a discipline in its infancy. And in the Victorian era, as we, as we call it in this country, people were very eager to learn about mental health disorders to better understand why people behaved in a certain way, particularly in dysfunctional ways that were seen as undesirable in the eyes of society. One of the things that was seen as undesirable, notoriously so in Victorian society and Western European cultures of the 19th century, were issues around sexual morality. And early psychiatrists focused heavily on sex and attributed certain sexual behaviours to psychological disorders. For example, Women who had excessive amounts of sex by Victorian standards could be diagnosed with nymphomania, which would lead to some people being imprisoned in asylums. Unlike how we approach mental health today, 19th century psychiatry often used pseudoscientific methods to discriminate against those who did not meet the standards of cer certain social norms. So, in other words, it was trying to pathologize things that were seen as undesirable in like upper class society were blamed on mental health disorders rather than just the bigotry of the people who, <laughs> who were talking about it. And this was the case with homosexuality. Same sex relationships were already illegal and deeply frowned upon in Western Europe in this period. And it was a pathologizing of this uh, behavior. Kraft Ebbing's theory was that homosexuality was the result of um, degenerate heredity. Um, and if that uh, term rings kind of eugenics, uh, Nazi alarm bells in your head, then you're kind of grasping the sort of conceptual world we're dealing with here. So to reiterate, reiterate, homosexuality as a word is not scientific. It's very much a pseudoscientific word. And it's also not ancient. It is, in fact, uh, as equally as old as the British supermarket chain uh, Sainsbury's. So why is it important to our discussion of queerness in the Bible today? While the vast majority of us may no longer believe same-sex attraction or relationships to be the result of a mental health disorder, the conceptual framework of homosexuality still deeply informs the way we see sexuality today. It's almost entirely overlooked, but the invention of that word transformed the way the world saw this topic in a very short space of time. In a matter of decades, the way French, uh, British, German people had previously thought about same-sex relationships changed and it was replaced by this new pseudoscientific concept. Then through colonialism, those people spread that idea throughout the world and it replaced native or traditional cultural ideas and understandings of same-sex relationships where they went. In fact, in every language, the word for homosexuality um, this is as far as my research <laughs> is, but uh, is, is a version of the word homosexuality. It's, it, it, there's, it's a concept that was really invented in this period. And um, if we look at the countries which still have um, death penalties uh, towards um, homosexuality and queer people, they are almost uh, invariably countries which have a Western colonial history. So this is really this lineage of this idea originating in Western Europe and then kind of spreading outwards and then being enforced and uh, homosexuality just replacing all these different uh, understandings of uh, same-sex relationships and same-sex um, attraction. Um, but even more than that, Western Europeans start to diagnose homosexuality trans-historically, that is, into our understanding of the past. In other words, not only did homosexuality take over contemporary ideas, it began to erase historical ideas. One of the best writers on this subject is the historian David Halperin. And I'm going to read you a rather lengthy quote of his, but I really feel uh, in this quote he summarizes more perfectly than I could, and I think anyone else has, just how this phenomena really changed the way we look at history and how we look at um, um, sexuality. The conceptual isolation of sexuality, per se, from questions of masculinity and femininity, made a new taxonomy of sexual behaviours and psychologies based entirely 
on the gender relations of the persons engaged in a sexual act, same gender versus different gender. It thereby obliterated a number of distinctions that had traditionally operated with earlier discourses pertaining to same gender sexual uh, contacts that had radically differentiated active from passive partners, normal from abnormal, conventional from unconventional sexual roles, masculine and feminine styles, uh, pederasty uh, from lesbianism. All such behaviours were now classed alike and placed under the same heading of homosexuality. Sexual identity was thus polarised around a central opposition defined by the binary play of sameness and difference in the gender relation of the sexual partners. People belonged henceforth to one or the other of two exclusive categories. And much ingenuity was lavished upon the multiplication of techniques for deciphering what a person's sexual orientation really was, independent, that is, of beguiling appearances, founded on positive, ascertainable, and objective behavioral phenomena on the facts of who had sex with whom. The new sexual taxonomy could lay claim to a descriptive trans-historical validity that was enshrined as a working concept in the social sciences. What that means (laughs) is basically that the idea, whereas in many different cultures you might have had certain social castes or... um, ways in which certain kinds of same-sex relationships would have been allowed or there was like room for same-sex attraction. Um, Homosexuality just kind of, as as I sort of mentioned, just kind of folded everything into it. It just, um, because it had this scientific air about it, people started looking at these different behaviours and started diagnosing homosexuality rather than looking at the relationships in the cultural context they might have uh, previously uh, been seen in. And it's something that we still to, to do today, and I'd like to sort of show you an example of that. Um, I'd like to show you an image. Okay. So this is a stamp from Russia uh, from 1968, but the uh, Im- image that's drawn on it is from uh, 1939, and it commemorates soldiers uh, returning from the First World War. And obviously it has this image of a soldier and he's coming back from war and he's kissing uh, a farmer on the mouth. Now, when we look at this stamp today in our modern sort of cultural context, it's hard to not see this as very gay. (laughs) It's giving gay. (laughs) Um, And that's a lot to do with our own cultural understandings of sexuality and uh, relationships, because if we see this kind of image in our contemporary society, it's always invariably related to um, queerness. However, that's not how the people who created this image um, saw it. Uh, In Russia and Northeastern Europe, um, in for centuries actually, and up until um, this time period, it was seen as a socially acceptable form of, as act of friendship for men to kiss on the mouth. Um, And when this stamp was published, homosexuality was illegal within the Soviet Union. So if this was created as an act of propaganda, this stamp, it wasn't made to be some kind of like statement of queer affirmation. So does this mean that this stamp um, or does this mean that any portrayal we have of a same-sex kiss in Russian history uh, between men isn't queer? No, it doesn't either. But I think what the point I'm trying to make here is that um, we can't really bring our own concepts to it. Maybe the person who made this image had some ulterior motive as to why he wanted to draw this specific thing. Maybe, maybe they were a queer person. But um, I think sometimes um, we especially post the kind of invention of our concept of of sexuality, we kind of forget that there's a lot more ambiguity sometimes in historical context when it comes to these kind of same gender interactions. Um, So as we go into the following Bible verses, I just want you to be very aware of that. Um, Most have had it uh, drilled into our head that these Bible verses we're about to approach should be read in a very specific way. Um, And I'd like to encourage you to basically just think, um, try and remove how you've been raised to see them uh, in how you read them and maybe think about some of the context that uh, might uh, inform actually how the readers or the authors of that text might have intended them to be uh, written. So um, 
now we've reached the um, uh, now we've reflected on the history of our own cultural understanding of sexuality, we can now begin to approach the Bible. In the words of the author L.P. Hartley, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And that's something we should be very aware with the um, biblical text. So we just looked at you know, these Russian soldiers making out. We see it as gay. It's not quite as we might see it now. The cultures we're about to look at in the Bible are even more different. Uh, the oldest book of the Bible is approximately, though it might be slightly older um, in its origins, uh, dates back to around um, 1000 BCE. So we're talking about maybe a few hundred years after the death of Tutankhamun. So like really the, he- the height of, uh, sort of ancient Egypt. And then the newest text in the New Testament in the Bible comes from about the first century. So around the time that the Roman baths were operating here in, in Bath. So it's quite a large span of time, a lot of different cultures and a lot of different ideas about um, sexuality and gender. Broadly speaking, uh, anti-LGBTQ plus Christians build their arguments around um, a handful of verses um, from the Bible uh, known often as the clobber verses or the clobber passages. And they're called that because they're used to try and shut down debate around sexuality, often with a discriminatory intent. Um, You may be aware of some of them already. Uh, These aren't the verses themselves, obviously, but sort of break them down into the sort of four main ones we're going to look at today. Um, In Genesis, there's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, In in Leviticus, you have um, the the, um, laws, uh, a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. And then uh, in the book Romans in the New Testament, we have uh, Paul discussing uh, unnatural relationships. And then in Corinthians, uh, that, um, a statement that homosexuals shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we're going to go over these and look at why these verses uh, are said to be against, or how these verses are said to be against queer people and how they might not accurately reflect the intent uh, of the passages and um, how it sort of becomes clear that there may be some deliberate twisting of these uh, texts to uh, suit a certain polemical goal. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah uh, is our first one, and it's a story from the Bible which we get our English word sodomy from. Um, And it's a story that's not often used that much these days by homophobic uh, um, and anti-LGBT Christians in the West. It's kind of a bit more used in the most fundamentalist traditions, like people at the Westboro Baptist Church might cite it. It's also used quite widely still in Eastern Europe and in the Orthodox Church, um, but used less so in this, this country nowadays. Um, it's a great place to start because it's a prime example of how um, shoehorning the word sort of homosexuality into the Bible text misses the nuance of the original meaning of the story. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah can be found in the first uh, book of the Bible known as uh, Genesis. Genesis is sort of the book which sets up creation and the very early history of the Jewish people and, and stuff like that. And for those of you who don't know the story, I'll tell you a a very abbreviated, loose version of it now. (laughs) So basically, God is uh, displeased with these two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he tells the prophet Abraham that he wants to destroy them. Abraham pleads to God not to do it because his cousin, in part because his cousin Lot lives in the, the, the city of Sodom. And he convinces God not to destroy Sodom if God can find 10 good people living there. So God sends down two angels disguised as men to find 10 good people in Sodom. And when they arrive, they arrive at the house of Lot, um, who looks after them and treats them very nicely. Uh, But in the middle of the night, all the men of Sodom come to Lot's house and demand that Lot brings the two angels who are disguised as men uh, down out of the house so that they may know them. The implication here is that they want to rape them, all the men of Sodom. And uh, so Lot offers his daughters instead, charming, Uh, (laughs) and they uh, refuse and uh, demand that um, the angels are brought down. Um, As a result, God destroys the city of Sodom and everyone in it except for Lot and his family. The homophobic interpretation of this story is simple, that God destroyed the city of Sodom for their sin of homosexuality. 
and this is often presented as a literal interpretation of the text. But this interpretation doesn't really hold up to a great deal of scrutiny. First and foremost, the act which is being referred to here as homosexuality is male rape. So we have to question here, what does this have to do with consensual, same-sex, loving relationships between people of the same gender? The thing that we're talking about when we're talking about the LGBTQ plus rights movement. The answer simply is none. It would be like taking a verse condem condemning heterosexual rape in the Bible and saying that it's a con condemnation of all heterosexual sex. Furthermore, to claim it's a literal interpretation of the Bible, um, um, to, to say that the sin of Sodom is homosexuality, overlooks that the fact that the Bible repeatedly tells us what the sin of Sodom was, and it's not that. Um, in the book Ezekiel 48-49, um, it's written, uh, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned, and they did not help the poor and the needy. Hospitality was something that was very, very important to the ancient cultures uh, that existed around the time of the Bible. If you think about um, ancient Southwest Asia, um, or what people used to call the Middle East, but there's people prefer now uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, you can imagine it was probably a very difficult place to live at the time, a, a bit of an inhospitable climate, especially in a world where there was no supermarkets, no, restaurant, no, no restaurants, no infrastructure, no healthcare, none of these things. The hospitality of a stranger, if you were in a difficult position, could really be a, a matter of life and death. So in these cultures, hospitality was very, very, very important. And the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, goes um, at length to emphasize the importance of being hospitable to strangers. Uh, in Leviticus 19, uh, 33 to 34, when a foreigner resides uh, among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as a native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Just on a side note, it is kind of funny that the sort of person who uh, stresses the importance of a literal interpretation of the, the Bible, perhaps we might say American fundamentalist Christians, might not necessarily read this verse literally about treating foreigners as if they're native born and making sure they're very hospitable. I mean, you know, not to get into any hypocrisy that might be in this, but like, they, 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 it might start becoming aware that there is some of that going on. <laughs> Uh, again, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is related to hospitality. In Matthew 10, 14 to 15, if anyone will not welcome you or listen your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So if people are unhospitable to you, then leave them to it because they've been inhospitable, so they will be judged for their in inhospitality. So the Bible makes it explicitly clear that the sin for which Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed was one of inhospi uh, inhospitality to strangers. But you may still ask, well, if that has nothing to do with sexuality, then why did they try and rape the angels disguised as men? Why is that the point the author is trying to make with this specific thing? In ancient Southwest Asia, there were very strict gender norms in all aspects of life. It was a very misogynistic society. And um, to treat a man as a woman was seen as an insult, uh, uh, as the most sort of, sort of gri grievous insult uh, to one's personhood. And in this line of thought, unfortunately, uh, raping, uh, male rape was seen as one of the most grotesque crimes you could commit. And so in times of war, or even as a punishment of certain crimes in certain um, 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 uh, civilizations, male rape was uh, seen. So in this instance, uh, with the context, I think it's clear to say with, um, clear to see that what we're dealing with in the text has nothing to do with consensual queer love or relationships, anything that we in the modern LGBT rights movement are concerned about. But instead, it's a sort of moral story about hospitality where this very extreme example of, of male rape is used to describe sort of how horrible these, these people were. So our first club of verse what does it have to do with LGBTQ plus people and the LGBTQ plus rights movement today? It does not really. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> um, so Leviticus uh, has these two verses about, um, which are often used uh, as anti-queer, and they read, uh, 
as this. So Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman, it is an abomination. And Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a male as if he were with a woman, both men have committed an abomination, uh, abomination and they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be put upon them. I remember first reading these Bible verses when I was about 11 or 12 years old, and I remember how much terror they put into me as a person. Um, because I was told that they were about me as a gay person. And I think these two Bible verses really, for a lot of queer people, do contain a lot of terror. Uh, and um, However, if we scratch the surface, it is actually questionable how much they are really to do with LGBTQ plus individuals as we understand them today. Now, uh, often actually some LGBTQ plus affirming Christians um, really avoid any discussion of these verses because, and, and with good reason actually, just in the, um, the books contained in, the, the, sorry, the laws contained in the book of Leviticus uh, include things like um, not eating pork, observing the Sabbath, um, generally things that are observed by uh, religiously practicing Jews today, but Christians kind of stopped practicing. Um, um, so they're, they're generally uh, largely ignored. But uh, even so, I think go, uh, they're worth having a look at um, and unpicking. Um, and if, uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, anti-LGBT Christians say these verses forbid uh, being homosexual. Firstly, it's important to note that as with the story of Song of Morum, the, the, these stories are about men. They're not about women. Uh, and in fact, there isn't anything in the Old Testament that directly uh, uh, relates to um, same-sex relationships between women. Secondly, uh, these verses, again, are not about relationships or love. They are uh, they're not even about all male same-sex sexual acts. It doesn't talk about anything else. Uh, merely, it references one specific uh, male same-sex act, penetrative sex. And uh, in, the, in the first one, and in this... Um, and in the second, uh, they focus. Sorry, I've really just like <laughs> I'm just I'm really struggling with my words today. <laughs> basically, it's really focused on basically male male anal sex, and it's very focused on the penetrative partner. Um, so, um, what's the author's intent here? Why is he specifically going out of his way to s speak something about? that. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of scholarly uncertainty as to why this uh, commandment exists. But my best, uh, or wh what I think is the best interpretation, um, was really taught to me by a good friend of mine who's a Jewish theologian, uh, a Serbian one called Stefan Sparavalo. And he said that um, in uh, the original Hebrew, the word uh, to lie with another man, uh, mishkave, um, is one that implies, uh, again, rape or a forceful um, sexual act. And I think when you take that again into the consideration of what we discussed with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, it paints a strong indicator that this verse, again, perhaps is a prohibition against the weaponization of, of male rape um, uh, that was prevalent within Southeast, uh, Southwest Asia during this period. Um, it's also, in the first verse, it's quite clear that it's just specifically focused on the um, active partner, so it doesn't have this condemnation of both that comes in the second verse. Um, and many scholars agree that actually the part that comes in the second half of the second verse is a later addition because the grammar is kind of quite different to the grammar of the first half. Um, I think, again, we find when we look at this verse and we remove the uh, ero erroneous idea that it speaks to our modern Western concept of homosexuality, uh, that it's a much more uh, plausible and culturally relevant um, meaning has been obscured. Uh, these two verses are the, or Genesis and Leviticus are the main verses from the Old Testament that are used as clobber verses, but they're actually not the only stories uh, in the uh, Old Testament that talk about same-sex relationships, and others are actually frequently overlooked. There are 
positive examples of same-sex relationships, and it's kind of interesting that the word homosexuality isn't applied to them as they're applied to these negative ones. Um, uh, David and Jonathan. Uh, as we've seen, there are many attempts to shoehorn homosexuality into place in the Bible that fits a certain discriminatory agenda. Um, but there are other places we could permissibly see same-sex love and relationships um, in a positive way. The relationship with David and Jonathan is a prime example of that. Uh, King David, uh, as in David and Goliath, David, as in Star of David, David, as in Song Hallelujah, David, Leonard Cohen, David, <laughs> uh, has a relationship with a man that could easily be interpreted as a homosexual or queer. Before David became king, his predecessor was a man, man named Saul, and his eldest son, Jonathan, was the next in line for the throne. David became very close with Jonathan, uh, much to the disapproval of Jonathan's father. And David describes his feelings in these words. Your love for me was, as, was wonderful, more wonderful than the love of any woman. When Saul tries to kill David numerous times, Jonathan betrays his father to save David. To quote the book of Samuel, when he finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. And Saul, Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, the word marriage is not used, but a great deal of imagery here is akin to marriage, particularly in the fact that Jonathan left his house uh, to go to David's house, which is a very symbolic part of um, marriage within the Bible, and that's something that's uh, reiterated by Jesus in the New Testament. And if all that romantic schmaltz <laughs> isn't enough for you, in 1 Dam uh, Samuel 20, 41, uh, they even kiss which some um, uh, biblical interpretations change to uh, them shaking hands. <laughs> the Good News translation, never use that one. <laughs> uh, furthermore, the covenant between David and Jonathan um, meant that when Jonathan dies, uh, sadly, David is next in line to the throne. So uh, it's clearly something that's very potent. Now, Christian tells, tradition tells us that David and Jonathan were just really, 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 really good friends. <laughs> or you could say they were roommates. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to go in depth as to whether we can say 100% uh, whether their relationship was queer or not. But I just think it's very, very interesting that when we have this kind of attempt to shoehorn this concept of homosexuality into the biblical text, it happens in places like Sodom and Gomorrah on a story about rape, or it happens in this story which has this very, um, again, has this uh, implication perhaps of rape, or is this very sexual focused one. But this story, which is about love um, and uh, a deep and passionate, uh, 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 meaningful love, that couldn't possibly be homosexuality. <laughs> that couldn't possibly be queer. Um, so I think that's really, um, just very revealing about the agenda of people who sort of interpret the, the Bible in a homophobic way. So, New Testament, halfway through now. <laughs> but these ones are slightly quicker. <laughs> um, the two verses we want to look at now are the New Testament. And this is a part of the Bible that tells us the story of Jesus and what happened after his death and the beginnings of the early Christian church. They come from a different culture and time period to the Old Testament that we've been discussing. And both of these verses come from the letters of Paul, which I think is interesting and significant in its own way because Jesus himself has nothing to say on the issue of same-sex relationships. There's, he doesn't address the issue, which I think is interesting. It's Paul who addresses it. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Paul was um, an early Christian who traveled around the Mediterranean converting people to Christianity. And he would write letters to the Christian communities uh, around the Mediterranean. And so, for example, his letter to the Romans was his letter he sent to the Romans, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many, m with uh, sermons, with spiritual advice, uh, and also a lot of telling people off. You kind of get the picture reading um, Paul's letters that he was a bit of an angry man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, the first verse uh, I'd like to address um, um, is um, his letter to the Romans. And in classic Paul, he's ranting about um, God, uh, how, how God is going to p- punish people for certain behaviours. Uh, it's Romans 1, 25, 27. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served uh, created things rather than the creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even women exchanged natural sexual behaviours for unnatural ones, in the same way that men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves due penalty for their error. I've always found this particular verse a little bit difficult to wrap my head around in terms of how to apply it to contemporary LGBTQ plus people because it sort of... Um, the the verses that come before it, he's basically talking about um, how people were pagans and worshipping pagan deities and how that led people away from God. Um, and so it seems to sort of, the implication seems to be here that worshipping pagan deities made them all queer and that was unnatural um, and it had this horrible effect on people. Um, and you know, I have been on TikTok, so I know that there are, you know, some of you who are out there worshipping pagan deities and being queer. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, each their own. But, you know, as an LGBTQ plus Christian myself, I hardly, I don't really know what this has to do with me specifically. (laughs) Um, And I don't even know how this really relates to an atheist queer person. It, It seems like quite a specific story. Um, furthermore, the word unnatural is interesting um, because we can observe that same-sex relationships exist within the natural world. Um, I think it's also important to point out at this point that um, sometimes people see the word natural here, especially because it refers to, for the first time, women's same-sex relationships, that um, that it was unnatural because the, it's natural for um, uh people to procreate and give birth to to children. And it's very interesting that that comes in Paul because um, one of the things that's very interesting about the sexual ethic of Paul or Paul's time is that, so um, when Jesus died, they believed that Jesus was going to come back. That's obviously a Christian belief that Jesus is going to come back, the second coming. But they really believed that was going to be very, very, very soon, like within their own lifetimes. So in uh, Paul's writings, he basically encourages people to be celibate, not to get married, because there's no time to get married. There's no time to have children. And so he's really, uh, he would really prefer everyone prefers a stay celibate. Um, He says basically people should only get married if they can't control their sexual lusts, basically. There's no really concern about children in that. So when people read this verse and they say, well, you know, they're unnatural because they're not having children, that really doesn't show that you really understand the kind of context of the person who was writing it, um, uh, Paul. So this is another verse where I just feel like it's really hard to see how this specifically relates the modern LGBTQ plus uh, rights movement or or queer people today. Our final um, clobber passage is uh, 1 Corinthians, 6, 9. And it's probably one of the more interesting um, uh, and elusive ones, uh, just because of the the, uh, language that's used in it. Um, So uh, I'm going to read it to you with some Greek words in it, and then I'm going to explain what the Greek words uh, mean in English. Um, Or you do not know the righteous, and you will not uh, inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers, nor malakos, nor arsenokoites. Uh, often, uh, translations today will translate the words uh, malakos uh, as effeminate and arsenokoites as homosexuals. Now, what's interesting about these words is that they're obscure and um, they've only... I mean, the second word, arsenokoites, has only been translated to the word homosexual um, or been used in in published versions of the Bible uh, uh, to mean homosexual since 1946, 
which uh, is the same year that Cher was born. So um, it's not long been uh, that the word homosexual <laughs> has even been <laughs> in the Bible. Um, but, but what do these words mean and, and why do, have they been interpreted uh, in this uh, particular way? Uh, well, Arsene, of course, is difficult to translate because um, as, as, far as, my research as far as my research indicates, um, it's actually the first recorded use of that word, in, as, as far as we know it, is in Paul. Uh, it's then used by later Christian writers, but no one has ever given us like, an exact definition of what that word actually means. Um, it means literally a man who beds men or, or, or man bedding or, or, or something of, the, of that ilk. Um, that obviously gives us a certain indication, but it is also important to remember that just because two words are put together it doesn't necessarily mean we know the definition. Like, for example, if humanity went extinct, for example, and aliens were trying to decipher English and they came across the word hot dog, you don't necessarily know what a hot dog is by knowing what the word hot and dog means. You know, like, we, we're not as essentially sure we know exactly what arsenicoitis means just because of the constituent parts of it. The reason why people kind of come to the conclusion that it perhaps has something to do with um, same-sex relationships is because of the word uh, that comes before it, which is malakos, which means soft, which um, was sometimes used uh, soft or effeminate, which... It's also sometimes used as a kind of, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, uh, to imply, so in the time period, the only form of socially acceptable same-sex relationship was pederasty, so older men and much younger boys, basically. And uh, soft referred to the fact that people would, uh, these young boys would shave the hair off their bodies so that they were soft, basically. So we can kind of imply, perhaps, from the fact that that was the contemporary form of socially acceptable um, same-sex relationship, and, and the use of this word that it may be referring to same-sex relationships. But again, I think we see that Paul, if he is condemning this kind of relationship, pederasty, which I think we would also condemn today, <laughs> as often these relationships were with prepubescent boys, we're again not really talking about things that are really relevant to the modern LGBTQ plus movement. The final thing I would just say about Paul and the way that sort of Paul is used to sort of attack the um, modern LGBTQ plus rights movement is that there are parts of Paul's letters in the New Testament that um, are you know, very relevant and that Christians use today. And then there are other parts that people are very happy, pa happy to just completely overlook and ignore and jettison as they want. One of those main ones is that Paul was quite in favour of slavery. Um, and even, you know, m most conservative, um, homophobic American evangelicals, for example, or uh, right-wing Christians in other denominations generally aren't pro-slavery and are very happy to ignore or overlook or contextualize Paul when Paul talks about slavery. But when it comes to the issue of sexuality, for some reason, that seems to be <laughs> a different question. So that kind of wraps up my taking on of these infamous clubber verses of the Bible. I know that was a lot, <laughs> a lot of history and a lot of context and a lot of different cultures, but I think what I want to try and uh, articulate in doing that is that I think we've been told, for those of us who are familiar with these texts, to read them in a very specific way. And I think we've been told to read them in such a specific way for so long that it's hard to sometimes see the wood from the trees and to actually know what they're uh, meaning is, I remember, you know, reading that that a man shall not lie with a woman, um, a, a man as with a woman, when I was a kid, and I was like absolutely certain that was about me. It's only now that, through studying theology, that I now know that it's not about me, and actually that many of these verses uh, have a much broader context, which is op deliberately obfuscated to fit a certain agenda. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if we have any time for questions, um, I'm more than happy to talk about 
these specific ones. If you have any broader questions about sexuality in the Bible, or if you want to talk about some trans stuff, I'm also happy to talk about that. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> cool. Hi. Hi, can I throw a select doozy of a question in the mix? Okay, hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious if you, um, I mean, first of all, that's really interesting, so thank you for that. I was just curious, you presented this as a, like, okay, here's homosexuality, here's how it kind of became this, like, concept I, I did that went all over the place. Um, and I was just, like, I, I totally recognise that, and a lot of the time when I'm talking even to queer people about queerness, a lot of it's trying to, like, unwork any concepts about what is this thing we call sexuality. Mm. And I was just curious if you had any thoughts about, like, okay, there is this, like, weird, like, diagnostic property to homosexuality, maybe that's, like, mm. distance from that idea. Is there any idea out there which is one worth moving towards? Is there any concept? Oh, there? interesting. Yeah, I mean, oh, good question. <laughs> um, I think that I think that in, in the um, firstly I think that the word homosexuality should really be done away with in, in contemporary society I think you know like I went to the doctor um, a couple of years ago and I remember the doctor asked me if I was a homosexual and I was like that is crazy that we were still, <laughs> still using that word um, I think that there is uh, under, understandably, I think, a tendency within um, uh, the queer movement to kind of go down to, like, very specific words. And I think that kind of comes from this kind of medical perspective on sexuality, you know, like, um, you know, sometimes I, I'd always try and keep myself really up to date with the like, new words and terms. And I think sometimes those are very empowering for people. But I also, I think I really like the model or the idea of queerness because I think, like, that as a concept seems to be about the opposite. You know, it's supposed, it's about kind of breaking down um, those like smaller distinctions and having that broader umbrella term that I think, you know, also seems to speak also to other cultural identities, you know, like two spirit and, and other um, uh, cultural distinctions of way of seeing sexuality. So I'm not entirely sure, I think, um, from like a kind of queer theory perspective, I guess I just like the idea of the word queer and moving towards more like broader terms. Um, I guess like, I was just trying to think if there's like a Christian perspective on that. I think, I think to be honest, if, <laughs> if in, the, in the church we could move to, to a place where we could see more, um, less disparity and more equality between just um, you know, heterosexual relationships and other forms of queer relationship, that would just be great at this point, <laughs> you know? <laughs> cool. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, are there other examples of um, queer relationships or queer people within um, scripture beyond David and Jonathan, or is it, a, is it something that we just don't see in there? Yes, there are. So the thing is, is that I feel so. <laughs> I feel just a little bit. Uh, I, I guess like a little torn when talking about those those things because I guess like sometimes like the the implications are very vague and. Um, I sort of don't want to be like doing it the opposite way round of like shoehorning queerness into a text where it shouldn't be there. Um, uh, or not that it shouldn't be there, but you know, like kind of, uh, I don't know, I, get, I guess I'm just trying to like, um, but yeah, so there's David Jonathan. There's a story um, in, the, in the New Testament where Jesus um, heals the servant of a centurion and the word in Greek, uh, often, or has also been used to refer to, uh, basically it implies that there was, possibly it implies that there was a sexual relation between the two of them, and uh, basically the centurion comes to Jesus and says, my servant is sick, and can you come and heal him? And he does, and I think, uh, I have my Bible on me somewhere, I could look it up, 
but it but they, they care for each other very deeply and some people have interpreted that as Jesus like blessing or in, in, in some sense like a queer relationship it's very vague though and it's like it's kind of like if you squint and look at it this way it could be this I feel like it kind of comes down somewhat to maybe when you're dealing with I think religious texts um, you can have a reading an academic reading and you can have your personal faith reading I don't have any problem in, in saying as a as a queer person of faith I definitely see David and Jonathan as like as a, as a queer relationship and something I sort of see as like something that is um, like a positive example of a queer relationship within the text as an academic I think I have some like reservations about like whether we can say that with like absolute certainty not in the Bible but one thing that I've written a lot about in my own work is um, queer saints um, in particular ones that were very prominent uh, in the Orthodox Church um, uh, uh, Sergius and Bacchus um, who were two um, Roman soldiers who form a covenant with one another I guess in a way you could see similar to David and Jonathan and um, it's discovered it's during the time where um, the Roman Empire was still pagan and the Roman Emperor uh, discovers that they are Christians and so asks them to renounce their um, Christian faith and they say no and in their hagiography which is their uh, story of their life as a saint it talks about how much they love each other and uh, and sort of try and help each other th through their persecution and in their persecution um, they are made to dress in women's clothes and are paraded around the, the city or whatever and then um, I believe it's uh, Sergius is decapitated and then Bacchus is in prison and whilst he's in prison um, Sergius appears to him in a vision and says that if you retain your Christian faith then your reward in heaven will be me which is quite queer some nights <laughs> as a story um, and also quite unprecedented um, because as we sort of discussed uh, early Christianity was very was not really about relationships often it was more about sort of celibacy um, so kind of um, unprecedented in that nature there was a form of um, same-sex union that used to take place in certain areas of Eastern Europe uh, and um, Southwest Asia, um, which the author David Boswell uh, said was akin to a form of same-sex marriage that used to take place in the Orthodox Church. That is a very contentious claim, <laughs> which I've personally written about, and I would argue that there, I think there is some standing in in that there is some some possible historicity in that but what I, I think that also talks about I think when we look at the history of homophobia within Christianity is that <clears throat> it's not like homophobia or like being against same-sex relationships is not a consistent presence throughout Christian history there are times where it, it is a thing I think it's Justinian, who had some laws against um, same-sex relationships, uh, but then it's sort of it, it's hard to tell how much those were actually implemented, or, uh, or 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 different things like that. And then they crop up again, and then the, you then you find some queer writings from monks, and then you you know it, it kind of kind of varies. Really, I would say you really see contempt like. You could really, I really think with the advent of the word homosexuality is where you start to see a consistent effort by Christians to suppress same-sex relationships because I think before then there wasn't this unified concept of sexuality and so it was kind of a bit patchy but ever since that word has kind of come into, certainly into, into the, the lexicon of Christians, ever since then the church seems to have been on a mission against queer people but it's not an inherent part of the Christian faith is what I would say so that was quite a long answer to that question but it went a lot of places <laughs> cool hello hello <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll just start this question. so for my, my master project I looked into a lot of 
the history about the kind of dissemination of Christianity into other cultures, mm -hmm. um, where like pre-colonization, they had like a way more extensive idea of like gender and sexuality. And I guess I was wondering if there's any evidence within like Bibles throughout history that they absorbed any of that rather than just like overlapping it. Right. Yeah. So, so did did external cultures influence Christian ideas of gender and yeah, sexual? Is there anything that they, they took on board rather than kind of mm. overlapping? Oh yeah, yeah. Or or destroying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, like, so with the yeah. I I mean. Um, I mean, cr Christian ideas of um, sexuality and gender are very influenced, sort of, by a mixture of um, what was the sort of sexual and gender gender norms of Jewish, you know, Jewish culture, and then also Greco-Roman kind of culture, and then you know, with these things, uh, you know, Christianity is a huge religion uh, with. Um, you know, uh, and spread across so many different cultures. So you do have, I think, in certain cultural uh, areas, like variations and different perspectives. But um, I don't, I don't think I could say to like, yeah, I don't, I don't think. I mean, actually, unfortunately, that kind of the opposite. I would say that I guess that um, British culture has had a big impact impact on the way that gender uh, gender and tradition and, and stuff are seen in, in Christianity. I mean, you know, uh, in, in um, I think a lot of days, you know, in the Western world, when we think of Christianity, we think of like uh, sobriety and like a lack of drinking as associated with Christianity, which is something that's really comes from British Christian Christianity from the 19th century, because in Eastern Europe, orthodoxy, not drinking is not really <laughs> seen as a part of our sort of like religious tradition. I, I think that colonialism has had a big impact on Christianity. I don't think, unfortunately, any of those those, those queer or different uh, things had an impact on Christianity. But I do think colonialism has had a big impact on Christianity over the last kind of few centuries. I mean, often, you know, when American, I, I feel like I'm really ragging on American Christianity today, but you know, um, 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 when people talk about like Christian values in the US, are they talking about like actually biblically Christian values or are they just talking about kind of conservative Western values that have become associated with Christianity? Thank you. Yeah, 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 go for it, yeah. Um, so you said about colonialism, and that was kind of what I was getting at with, with my original point, just sort of the dissemination of, of the, the British oh, yeah, yeah. into everything else. But is there a point where it's like obvious that there starts to be a distinction between kind of colonial Christian values and pre-colonial Christian values? Well, I, I would say... My... Um, my sort of in, my perspective on Christianity is very much influenced by the fact that I am myself an Orthodox Christian, and um, Orthodoxy, for those of you who don't know, is yeah, it's a Christianity mainly in Eastern Europe, uh, Northeast Africa, um, Southwest Asia, and um, it's uh, if you have no familiarity with it, I guess it's most similar to Catholicism in that it's a lot of smells and bells and about kind of. Um, <laughs> preservation of kind of like ancient Christianity. And um, what's really interesting, uh, one of the things I, I really love, one of the reasons I really love my faith is that um, there is a huge preservation of really ancient Christian beliefs in it. But in the last kind of 100 years or so, um, obviously many people from Eastern Europe migrated to America and to Western Europe in, in search of a better life, and have brought uh, that's brought um, Western Christian ideas increasingly into um, Orthodoxy, and introduced ideas uh, that were previously kind of alien to our our faith, uh, and um, and not great. 
um, you know, there's, you know, in, in the West, there's this very strong idea of like kind of conservative and liberal Christianity, um, and uh, in the U.S. Um, there's been a big push to see orthodoxy as like a very conservative form of Christianity, but there are things about orthodoxy that um, would make it liberal, I guess. Uh, for example, like divorce has always been a part of the orthodox Christian tradition, which is would be seen as like liberal in some ways, and there's other aspects of orthodoxy which might be seen as more liberal. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that uh, I mean, obviously, from the colonial period, you see the spread of, the, of that kind of colonial Christianity, but it's still worming its way today into various denominations, and it's still a sort of a, a battle that's kind of taking place, I guess, in many ways. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have, oh, sorry. Do you, that's all right. Oh yeah, it's really it's a great book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, well, you can buy it. It's a very little book. Um, it's an essay. I th um, it's called uh, "On Bullshit" by um, it's Harry G. Frankfurt, isn't it? Uh, and uh, yeah, I read that as a teenager, and I thought it was so c cool and rebellious coming into <laughs> coming into class, being like, "I'm reading my book." <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's a uh, no bullshit. It's a very interesting concept, actually. Hiya. Hiya. Um, I work as the trans non-binary lead, oh, lead within the university, and um, I've had, I have my own Christian faith, but I've had Christian friends challenge me saying that what I'm doing is sort of wrong mm. because um, individuals, that God has given them the body they've, they've been born into, they shouldn't change it, they should sort of find ways, it's the yep. best. And I'm just wondering if there's anything within the Bible that I can use as a sort of kind of an argument against that. Yeah. I obviously believe something completely different. Yes. I'm getting out of my Bible. <laughs> 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 I'm getting serious. Yeah, yeah. So, because um, I recently did a thing about this uh, recently. Um, so, in the creation story, because that's often what people cite. Jacob Rees-Mogg recently cited it, and I, and, I, and I did a little thing. But basically, that you can't have trans... Um, you know, that trans identity is not valid because God created people, um, male and female. Now, that comes in the creation story in Genesis, so at the very beginning of the Bible. Um, and in that story, God creates like a whole variety of um, dichotomies. So he creates, uh, he, he separates the, the light from the darkness, the night from the day, uh, the land from the earth, the heavens from the waters, uh, stuff like that, and then it goes on to say they're male and female. But I think what's very clear from people who live it in the world is that those, none of those dichotomies are strict dichotomies. That night and day are not strict dichotomies. What about twilight, dawn, dusk? You know, uh, the heavens from the waters, what about rain, clouds, the moisture in the air? It goes through a variety of different dichotomies which are clearly not strict dichotomies, finishing up pretty much with gender, why can't we then see gender as a spectrum as we see all those other different things uh, in the creation story? Thank you. <laughs> 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 Does anyone else have any questions? Um, Nick, I was very interested in what you said about how homosexuality is sort of in turn invented by a 19th century psychiatrist. Um, how were same-sex relationships referred to in Western culture before that trend started? Mm. Because I can't think of any examples in literature, I mean, not that I'm particularly well read, but yeah. I can't think of any examples where same-sex relationships were clearly happening yeah. and were not judged. So um, it's something I've wanted to study more generally myself, and it's actually like a bit of a gap in, in studying in queer theory generally. But, um, so it seems that in the, as I'm sure you're aware, in the, um, within the Greco-Roman world, there was a certain tolerance for same-sex relationships. When uh, the Roman Empire fell, it seems that quite quickly afterwards, um, there w became an intolerance for it. That might perhaps be due to feudalism and basically the idea of, um, well, <clears throat> it might be the decline of urbanism. So um, 
where people were living more agrarian societies, obviously having children was more important uh, for the continuation of, 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 of uh, families and societies became more important once big cities collapsed. And then also feudalism with the passing down of, of things meant that the importance of having children in that way was more significant. Um, before um, we had homosexuality in British, uh, obviously in English we had the word sodomy, but what's quite interesting is that sodomy um, in some of its most early definitions also referred to um, basically any sex act that was like not missionary um, position, um, a heterosexual sex. So um, it could um, refer to um, sexual acts where the woman was on top, or could be described as sodomy, uh, and, um, and um, other uh, sort of sexual acts. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and so I think pre-homosexuality, um, I think there was less this idea that I think there's this idea, idea now with homosexuality, or not now, but it created this idea that basically if you do something that could be perceived as homosexual, that you were a homosexual. And I think in, in society pre the invention of that term, or pre the kind of, because there was, you know, homosexuality came to pathologize something that was already frowned upon in Victorian society. So it's not as if the Victorians uh, didn't already have some uh, uh, negative inclination towards it. Yeah, yeah, they they had they had their. Well, it, it, yeah, it's yeah. Well, it's not that it was. I think that it was more of a uh, people were more, perhaps in the previous era period, uh, um, you had more to, like tolerance towards it because it wasn't seen as. What makes sexuality an interesting concept, sorry, is that it, it's like an identity. And I think beforehand, there wasn't this idea of sexuality as an identity. It was more things people did. So I think same sex, like a, a man who had sex with a man, it might have just been a thing that happened. And it wasn't seen as like a mark against, like it wasn't a, 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 a characteristic against them your, yourself. So, so, um, to answer your question, sorry, I'm, I'm very like going around the houses at the moment. <laughs> um, in Western society, there was already some kind of negative disposition towards same-sex relationships, for sure. Uh, I don't think it was as like concentrated. I think basically the word homosexuality gave um, a co like a kind of catalyst or a conduit by which it kind of became more focused. Um, so I think I think that kind of answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what, what is it now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, what we're looking for is celebration, not, you know, tolerance. I think it's really amazing when you look at cultures around the world and you see the ways that other cultures outside of, like, Western European society found their ways of celebrating queerness, whether that be, like, you know, hijras in India or, you know, two-spirit people. Um, uh, and there's you know many other like examples of that. Um, I think Western, basically, I think Western society has had a kind of proclivity against queerness, broadly speaking, for quite some time, and it just kind of concentrated into this concept that then exploded outwards and kind of has led led to where we are today. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming and everyone on the, the live stream as well. Um, remember to book on to other events if you can. We'd love to see you there and have good evenings. Thank you so much. Today. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>
where we have four guest speakers speaking all about sexuality, race, gender, allyship, disability, where we can hear their actual lived experience, which is so important for us to grow and learn. We'll also have various workshops where you can help us shape equality, diversity and inclusion at Buff Spa University. All of these events will be at Locksbrook, Newton Park and online and is welcome for anybody to come and join us from staff, students to the general public too. So join us from the 20th to the 24th of March for Equality Week. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us?